words that we use to describe prokaryotic cell shapes. Some microorganisms that are prokaryotic in cell structure are spherical or round when we look at them through the microscope. If we see a single round or spherical microorganism that's prokaryotic in cell structure, or even sometimes eukaryotic, we would use the word coccus, C-O-C-C-U-S, to describe a single one. If we have more than one, then we change the ending from a U-S, which is singular in Latin, to an I, which would be the plural ending, and we might add a prefix that tells us the arrangement of the spherical shaped cells. If there are two in pairs, then we would use the prefix diplo. If we find them in chains, like pearls or beads on a string, then we use the prefix strepto, which is derived from a term, a Greek and Latin term, that means chain of. If they're in pairs that package together in groups of four, we would use the word tetrad. If it's in a little box-shaped arrangement in groups of eight, we would use the word sarsony, and if we see them in grape-like clusters, we would use the prefix staphylo, which means grape-like cluster, and then again use that root word coccus, and we'd have staphylococcus, or the plural form would be staphylococci. The different arrangements often illustrate the planes of cell division. Is it one plane, two, three, or many? Based on what we've just described for terminology, how would you describe this image of bacteria in this photo? If we have prokaryotic cells that have a length that's longer than, let's say, the width, so we have what I call finger-shaped or hot dog-shaped, rod-shaped prokaryotic cells, then we would use the word bacillus if it's singular, and then bacilli if it's more than one. Again, depending on how they're arranged, we can have diplobacilli, streptobacilli, or even what are called cacobacilli. A cacobacillus has mm, kind of a football shape or pillow shape. It's not really very long, um, but it's not truly spherical either. But how would you describe these prokaryotic cells? The notes or the figure description of the previous photo says that those are rod-shaped bacteria. Well, they're not truly rod-shaped, are they? They're actually slightly curved. And in fact, we have additional terminology that microbiologists use to, to describe curved prokaryotic cell structure. If they're comma-shaped, we call them vibrio. If they're gently S-shaped or undulating, we call them spirillum. If they're tightly coiled and helical, we'd use the word spirochete. Most prokaryotic cell shape is very fundamental geometric in structure. We do have some alternatives that have been discovered in the last 20 years or so. There are some star-shaped bacteria that are essentially little triangles uh, wedged together. And rectangular prokaryotic bacteria have also been discovered. But that's pretty much the limit. There aren't too many other kinds of shapes that are used to describe prokaryotic cell structure. Stalhimosa is a specific example of a bacterium that has that star shape that's an alternative to either a coccus or a bacillus. This organism is found in soil and aquatic environments and is a typical kind of soil organism. We could even find it, as they say, in animal feces. It's one of nature's recyclers. It's described as a gram-negative non-modal bacterium. They'll make more sense when we describe those concepts in more detail during the semester, but it says it has no motility or movement structure. 
it'll have a particular appearance when we try to stain it that we call gram negative, and it's a facultative anaerobe. Anaerobe should suggest to you that it doesn't need oxygen. Anytime we add a or an at the beginning of a word, that essentially negates that word. So anaerobe, no oxygen, or air. And facultative gives us an idea of the alternative metabolic pathways it can use. So Stella humosa is a unique kind of example of bacterium. Haloquadra walsby is an example of rectangular or square-shaped prokaryotic cells. They were initially discovered in very salty pools near the Red Sea in 1980 by Tony Walsby, hence the species name. And you can see these are actually flat, square or rectangular shaped prokaryotic organisms. The halo is part of the name of this organism, should tell you this is a salt-loving organism. Here's an example of a bacterium that's very unusual. The mixobacterium grow and reproduce in a slightly different way than most bacteria by producing little tiny things that we call buds. You can see they're, they're little roundish or oval shaped projections at the end of this sort of stem-like structure and just another alternative shape or type of prokaryotic organism. Hyphomicrobium is another example of an unusual type of bacteria that doesn't have a traditional geometric shape and doesn't have a traditional method of reproduction that we call binary fission. Now we'll describe binary fission as a reproductive method a little bit later in more detail, but if we take a look at hyphomicrobium, here we have sort of a mm, sort of pillow-shaped to rod-shaped bacteria that actually produces a long stalk-like extension and then a young bud that's actually an identical copy of the original prokaryotic cell for a reproductive structure. Very unusual. When these were first discovered, it was quite startling to see these prokaryotic cells with these very unusual reproduction methods. Here we have some photo in image of Colobacter. Colobacter was really one of the first stalked or unusual types of prokaryotic bacteria ever discovered. It has this little stalk that it used to attach to the bottom of a pond or rocky surface, and then it produces a budding swimming daughter cell, so very unusual kind of life cycle, as well as structural appearance. These really were truly the first unique kinds of bacteria discovered. Uh, several decades ago. But again, all examples of different kinds of bacteria and different kinds of microorganisms. And here we have an example of a very unusual type of bacteria called Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Mycoplasma pneumoniae has a structure we call cell wall-less. Uh, most bacteria do have an envelope surrounding the cell structure that we call a bacterial cell wall. Well, mycoplasma doesn't, but yet if we take a look at its fundamental cell structure, it still is considered to be prokaryotic. We've included this in our list of unique kinds of microorganisms and examples of types of microorganisms because this one actually causes walking pneumonia. It's a very common type of respiratory illness, especially among college-age students. So mycoplasma pneumoniae, a good one to add to our list. Now some terms that we use to describe the relationships that we might have with microorganisms. The term that we use to describe two organisms living closely together is symbiosis. 
Symbiosis has various sort of subcategories, but a good general example that we can see every day if we go out in the woods are lichen. Lichen are types of algae and fungi that have developed a very close, intimate dependence and relationship with one another. And if we take a look at the internal structure, we can find that the fungi provides the scaffolding and the algae is essentially a source of, of nutrients or provides nutrients to the fungi. So if you try to take the two apart and grow them separately, they really don't grow well at all if you can get them to grow. You put the two of them back together and we create these structures that we call lichen on rocks and trees and such if we're walking around in the woods. I mentioned there were different types of symbiotic relationships and we actually have three terms to describe the three various types. Mutualism simply means that both organisms in the symbiotic relationship benefit from that relationship. We have quite a few microorganisms both in and on our body that are mutualistic. They actually benefit from having a place to live, maybe getting some nutrients from our bodies, and we benefit from them um, maybe growing in our intestinal tract. Commensalism or commensal organisms they benefit, but they don't harm us in the process. We have lots of microorganisms that fall into that category. In fact, it's estimated that probably about 95 to 99 percent of all microorganisms in the form of prokaryotes fall under these first two categories of symbiotic relationships. The third category, unfortunately, is the one where we have one organism benefiting while the other is harmed. That's called parasitism. We describe those kinds of microorganisms as parasites. This is the category that catches our attention because of the harm that they can do and resulting disease that they can cause. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria that are found in the root nodules of plants that we call legumes, L-E-G-U-M-E-S, like clover, alfalfa, peanuts, those nitrogen-fixing bacteria actually have a close semantic relationship with these plants, and they provide essentially a source of fertilizer for the plant to use. Here's another example of a semantic relationship. Those little tiny golden structures on these long tendrils are golden algae that have developed a symbiotic relationship with this foraminifera, this little roundish little structure in the center with those long tendrils on the outside. The golden algae are found on the sort of the inside of the shell of this foraminifera and along the little tendrils and the algae have a great place to live. They're gathering nutrients and sharing nutrients with the foraminifera and the foraminifera benefit from all those nutrients. Other terms that we need to make certain that we're familiar with and that we will use all semester. Now, if you take a look in dictionaries or textbooks, some of these terms have almost exactly the same definitions, but we're going to use and create definitions that are a little bit more specific and unique to each term. So, when we're talking about contamination, we're introducing microorganisms into or onto an area that we don't want the microorganism to be on. Transmissible, communicable, and contagious. All are terms that deal with the transmission or the transfer of microorganisms. So transmissible simply means the transfer of microorganisms. Could be from person to person. Could be from an inanimate object to a person. And that's often the, the concept or definition behind the word transmissible. From an object to a person. Communicable simply means the transfer of microorganism from person to person. Contagious implies easy transfer. So when we say something is contagious, we often are implying that it's easily transferred from person to person. Sometimes very easily. We use the phrase highly contagious. So some kind of microorganism is easily, very, very easily transferred from person to person. A saprophyte is one of nature's decomposers. 
So there are many fungi and bacteria that are nature's decomposers, or they break down organic material from, let's say, a dead animal or a plant. And another word for a decomposer would be saprophyte. A disease-causing microorganism is a pathogen. And we can modify that term into an adjective or a descriptor. We say pathogenicity. Virulence, the severity of the symptoms. Infection, the growth of microorganism. Infestation, the growth and appearance of insects or worms. Disease, not at ease. All of these are very common terms that we've used almost on a regular routine basis, especially those of us that work in healthcare. But for our class, we need to have more specific definitions so we can describe and discuss these terms. In 2001, along the East Coast, through New York, down to Florida, there were several cases of anthrax. In the news, they reported that anthrax was transmissible and not communicable. With the definitions that we're using now, that are a little bit more specific, does it actually make you feel safer to know that anthrax is a transmissible disease that can be transferred from an inanimate object to a person versus a communicable disease that can be transmitted from person to person?